Hello, I'm Edward Carter, the vicar at St Peter Mancroft Church and I'm here in my garden on another lovely sunny morning. And I want to talk today about a particular book and indeed it's become a television series which has been, well, quite influential really on me as I think about uh, matters of faith and the Christian faith. It's a book that I'm sure you all have heard of, although you may not have read the book. It's called Call the Midwife. And you may be wondering why it looks quite such a, a dour cover, if you can see it there. And that's because this is actually a first edition copy of Call the Midwife. My wife Sarah was much involved in antenatal care for a number of years and part of the network she's in, um, they, they heard about um, this uh, lady, Jennifer Worth, who wrote the book out of her own memoirs as a midwife in the East End of London. Um, and it was generally felt to be a, a tremendous uh, thing to be supported. Um, people thought it would be just a, a small memoir enjoyed by those involved in midwifery. And so support was drummed up. As I say, my wife Sarah um, joined the list of those willing to buy a copy. Um, it was first published in the year 2002 uh, by a small publisher and was well received, but very small scale. However, um, what happened was that the, um, the BBC, someone at the BBC got interested in this book, obviously came across it somehow, I don't know the whole story, and they felt it would make a very good uh, adaptation for television. So they put together a pitch and uh, floated it with whoever these things need to be floated with uh, when you're putting something up on TV. And uh, they were told no, uh, not suitable. Um, why? Why? Great story, human interest, uh, surely it'll make a good series. No, no, uh, too much religion, too much Christian faith. Uh, the public don't want that sort of thing. And anyway, we can't risk getting involved in stuff like that. Yeah, we don't talk about faith anymore in the, in the public uh, space. Anyway, luckily, <laughs> the uh, person who was uh, suggesting that, that this book be turned into a television series was persistent and uh, pushed back and said, look, it will make a good series. Just give it a go. Let's give it a try. And something happened somewhere, so I'm sure it's well documented what the story is as to how this then actually did come about. Um, the, uh, the word eventually was, yes, OK, we'll give it a go. Mm, that might be an ambulance going past now. Um, anyway, um, what happened was that they made a series. Um, and of course, that's what's made Call the Midwife very famous indeed. That was in 2012, so 10 years after the, the book was published. Um, and uh, what happened was it, it first aired, I think, middle of January 2012, and there were 10 million viewers for that first episode, and the numbers watching grew through the series. Now, 10 million viewers, um, if you're a BBC executive, a TV executive, well, then that's when you sit up and take notice. Uh, this was one of the most popular things the BBC had done for a long time. So, of course, suddenly the whole thing flipped from being, we don't do things like that, we don't do religion in particular, um, to, oh, well, obviously this really is of interest to the public. People like it, people love it. Oh, we better make more. And to cut a long story short, uh, it's still going strong. Um, I think, as I speak, uh, plans are pretty much set for series 11, which is to 2022. And so it's been a series every year ever since. Um, and the first series was, was pretty much based, loosely based, uh, on real episodes from uh, Jennifer Worth's book. Uh, she was Jenny Lee before her, her married uh, name then changed her to, to Jennifer Worth. So Jenny Lee was a young midwife in the East End of London. And her memoirs were adapted fairly faithfully, really, in the first series, although adapted a bit. But of course, there wasn't enough in the book to make 11 series, so now um, it's, uh, it's kind of floated free, but in the spirit of <coughs> Call the Midwife, and it's still much loved. So, the series is great. Um, some, some great uh, actors involved, of course, Jenny Agata, um, and uh, Jessica Rain plays the, the lead character, Jenny Lee, um, and Miranda Hart, others as well. Very well acted, um, very well observed, uh, very human actually, and with a strong strand 
of the Christian faith running through it. And I think that's what's really um, one of the things that's drawn me to call the midwife. It is a great story, but the way in which matters of faith and spirituality are woven into the very fabric of life, life and death really, when you're a midwife and involved in health care, uh, particularly a place like East London soon after the Second World War, well, that's when matters of life and death are writ large. And those who have a faith, who believe in God, well they would recognise that actually that's when matters of faith really count, that's when they really bite. Uh, all too often uh, faith, being a churchgoer, belief, is seen as a kind of leisure activity really, something you do maybe on a Sunday morning, maybe something you do a lot uh, through life. That's fine, that's good, but actually really, really matters of faith, matters of God are not just um, the uh, icing on the cake of an otherwise perfectly happy life. They're, they're the very ingredients of the cake. They are the heart, uh, so those who believe would say, of life. Um, and this book, and then even the adaptation in a beautiful way, bring that to life. The really lovely thing is that um, Jenny Lee, as she was, uh, wasn't sure whether she believed in God or not. She was what's called an agnostic. She wasn't a kind of out-and-out -out atheist at all, um, not militant in any way. I think she just felt, the way she describes it, that life was full of fun things, busy things. She didn't really need God and she wasn't sure if God was a real thing or not. And of course that can be true for all of us in, in different ways. I've certainly journeyed through some of that in my own life. But the book illustrates beautifully not a kind of lovely, oh well, um, I started not believing and I end up believing. No, something much richer, much more powerful really. Um, Jenny Lee writes movingly about how she keeps asking herself, hmm, I wonder why these, these nuns, these sisters, because at the heart of the book where Jenny Lee is living is Nonata's house, it's a, a convent in East London. Um, the real place, um, real sisters who mysteriously give much of their time to prayer and worship alongside uh, the care that they're giving to their community as midwives and in other ways. And Jenny Lee wonders, why? Why do people do this? What is this mysterious aspect of life uh, that I see as part of the life of this community which I'm living with? And so she doesn't exactly end the book saying, and now I believe. She ends the book reflecting movingly about how God in a way has sought her out and has just opened that first little chink of the door. Anyway, I thought I might just read one or two uh, short bits. There's a lovely chapter in the middle of the book, um, which is headed up a Christmas baby, so Christmas day. And um, Jenny's uh, on duty, of course, as, as you have to be when you're a midwife. And she's made it to the house where a baby is due. And uh, she, she writes this um, uh, in, in, in her book. I sat in the firelight and allowed my mind to wander backwards. I'd spent many Christmases in hospitals. Contrary to what one might think, it was a happy time. Fifty years ago, hospitals were very much more personal than they are today. The nursing hierarchy was formidable, but at least everyone knew or was acquainted with everyone else. Patients stayed in hospital for much longer, and as nurses worked 60 hours per week, we really got to know our patients as people. At Christmas, everyone let their hair down, and even the most draconian old ward sister, after a few sherries, would be giggling with the student nurses. It was all rather schoolgirl fun, but it was good-humoured, and the aim was to give a happy time to the patients, many of whom had horrible diseases. My most abiding Christmas memory was the carol singing on Christmas Eve. Led by matron, all the nursing staff went through the wards by candlelight singing. For someone in a hospital bed, it must have been a lovely sight. There may have been over 100 nurses, 20 or more doctors, and 50 or more ancillary staff. The nurses wore full uniform, and we turned our cloaks inside out, showing the scarlet lining. We all carried candles. We walked through each darkened ward, usually containing 30 beds, singing 
The age old story of Christmas. All this has long since gone from hospitals and the memory of it is all that remains. But it was very beautiful and I know that many patients shed tears of emotion. Those are powerful words for me. They speak about uh, the beauty of what life can be, even in the midst of pain and tragedy, when the spiritual element is acknowledged and is brought fully to bear with our ordinary, everyday physical lives. How lovely that someone who wasn't really sure if she believed in God could write such a moving, moving thing. And then just towards the end of the chapter, the baby is, is delivered safely and um, Jenny heads off out um, into the cold, of course, of a December uh, night. And she writes this as the chapter ends. Out in the street, after the excess of the delivery room, the cold cut me like a knife. It was a cloudless night and the stars shone brightly. There was very little street lighting in those days, and starlight was a reality. A heavy frost had descended in all its beauty, covering the black stones of the pavements, the walls, the houses, even my bicycle. I shivered and decided I must pedal very hard to keep myself warm. Only a mile or two away from Nanata's house, a sudden impulse made me turn right into the West Ferry Road and onto the Isle of Dogs. To go all the way round the aisle before rejoining the East India Dock Road is a seven or eight mile ride, and I can't tell you what prompted me to do it. No one was about. The docks were closed and the ships in port were silent. The splash of the water was the only sound as I cycled over the West Ferry Bridge. On the aisle there were no lights apart from the starlight and the Christmas tree lights in the windows of many houses. The great majestic Thames was on my right, closely guarding all its secrets. I cycled more slowly, as though afraid to break the spell of silence. As I turned westwards, a low moon started to rise, and a silver path shone across the river from Greenwich to my feet, or so it seemed. I had to stop my bicycle. It looked as though I could have walked on silvered feet from the north to the south bank of the Thames. My thoughts were fleeting and flickering, like the moonlight on the water. What was happening to me? Why was the work so engrossing? Above all, why were the sisters affecting me so deeply? I remembered my scornful reaction only 24 hours earlier to the crib in the chapel, and then the calm beauty of Sister Bernadette's face as she said her daily office by the firelight. I couldn't match up the two. I couldn't understand. All I knew was that I couldn't dismiss it.